Welcome back to New Testament Survey. We're going to look at the book of Romans today. And hopefully every time you're watching, you have your Bible, but it's very important in this one to have your Bible to follow along. Romans is huge. It, it really is. Romans is such a great book because it's such a deep explanation of the power of the gospel and what the gospel really is. And it's a... Uh, Remember when I was a kid, we used to go to a restaurant steakhouse, and they had a 33-ounce porterhouse steak, and if you could finish it, you, ate, you got it for free. <laughs> and that's a lot, the 33 ounces. Romans is the porterhouse steak of the New Testament. It is, there's so much, and it, you, you got to take your time and chew on it slowly, just like you would that porterhouse, making myself hungry right now. But when we get to Romans, who, who's the author uh, of Romans? The, the author is the Apostle Paul, whom we learned about last week in Acts. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And he, would, he wrote it from Corinth. And so when you're in the book of Acts and you see Paul in Corinth, he wrote this letter to, to the Romans. But Paul didn't actually physically handwrite this. He dictated it. He dictated it to a guy named Tertius. We find this in Romans 16, 22. I, Tertius, who have written this letter, greet you in the Lord. The Apostle Paul had eyesight problem, we see, from some of his letters. Sometimes he wrote it with his own hands, and he praised himself for being able to do it. This one he dictated and Tertius wrote down everything that Paul uh, said to him. And he wanted Paul, I mean, Tertius wanted to, to know that, hey, he put his signature on here. I was part of this with, with you. It was written around 57 to 58 A.D. And the people he wrote to um, is the, Rome, the people in Rome, the church in Rome, in verse, chapter 1, verse 7. In all... To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't have any record of the apostles going to Rome to plant churches. Uh, How did this church begin in Rome? I think we get a little hint when we go back to the day of Pentecost And there were people from all over uh, the world in Acts chapter 2, verse 10, says some of the people that were listening to Peter preach that message were visitors from Rome. So they heard the gospel preached by Peter and then took that message back to Rome. They became disciples of Jesus filled with the Spirit, and that's how the church spread as well. They just went back and began to tell people about Jesus and meet together. And Paul wanted this church in Rome even though he hadn't been there yet, he wanted them to have a a deep understanding of the gospel so that false teachers wouldn't come in, you know, behind him and and dilute the gospel. The main theme of the book of Romans is the power of the gospel. How powerful is the gospel? When we speak the name of Jesus, when we share what he did, there's power in the gospel, the good news itself. The key verses are... Chapter 1, 15 through 17. Paul says, That is why I am eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Martin Luther is considered uh, you know, one of the great reformers of the church. He was a, a Catholic priest, and he, uh, part of the, being part of the Roman Catholic Church in Germany, he, he joined the, the monastery and joined, wanted to be in the ministry out of some uh, weird vow he made to God when he thought he was going to get struck by lightning. And he said, I'll become, I'll become a monk. I'll become a priest. I'll become a priest. And he 
did not have a good vision of God. He didn't understand the gospel. Here's a guy that's in, you know, in a monastery, and he did not understand the gospel. And he just, he thought God was just this, he saw God as judge, lawgiver. And he was out to get him at every, every turn. And Luther was told to go study the scriptures. And he was reading the book of Romans. And when he read those verses, something went off inside of him that it wasn't about what he did for God. It was about what God did for him in the gospel and what Jesus, that the just shall live by faith or the righteous shall live by faith, not by works, not by my deeds, but by my faith. And then the, the Protestant Reformation took off from there with, with other folks where they, they realized the church had gotten off on its preaching of the gospel and they centered it back on, on Jesus. The contents and outline of Romans is, there's a lot, again. So if we take this little piece by piece is, is the best way to, to read Romans. But the first 11 chapters, the theme is all about justification by faith. The word justify or justification means God declares us righteous, holy, and not guilty based upon our faith in what Jesus did because Jesus is righteous and holy and obviously not guilty. And it's about being, putting our faith in Jesus. And so that's what he unpacks the first 11, first half of the book and he starts out in chapter 1, verse 18, and goes all the way through chapter 3 through 20, talking about the problem of sin. The problem of sin. And that human depravity is equal for all, all people. All people, that he levels the playing field. For example, in chapter 1, 18 through 32, he, he talks about the hedonist those who live for pleasure, those who live for self, those who distort what, what is, is natural to creation and what our conscience teaches us without even having you know, to read the Bible. People should know by their own conscience, Paul talks about what's right and wrong. He has a heavy message there. But then he flips it in chapter 2 and says that the moralist, the people who look down on other people and judge other people, that they're just as guilty by their judgment of others, and so they're, they're sinful too. And then he talks about the religious in the second part of chapter 2, that the Jews who had the law, and they, they don't obey the law, and that, that all of humanity is guilty regardless of where you come from. He talks about universal corruption of the human heart and mind in chapter 3, 1 through 20. So in a sense, he's teeing up the good news laying out the bad news, the bad news of universal corruption, and levels the playing field so that we can all embrace the gospel, that there's not one person that Jesus didn't come and die for, and that is not in need of Jesus himself and what he did. And then in chapter 3, he, um, he talks about what I call positional righteousness. It's It's how God sees us. He sees, he, God already sees the finished product of you and I becoming like Jesus because of our faith in Jesus. And we're in this process of becoming like him and our, our outward righteousness and obedience to him, but we're all imperfect. But we're in Christ, so it's, it's almost like when my kids were little and they disobeyed me, they didn't stop becoming my kids. They, they had to learn, and so that's us learning, but the, our position is in Christ. In verse 21 of chapter 3, he says, after he gives all this bad news, he says, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified, there's that key, as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Very important. And then in chapter 4, he kind of takes his case of justification by faith a little bit further in talking about Abraham in the Old Testament. If you remember, God told Abraham what he was going to do through him, 
And Abraham trusted God's word. And it says, Abraham believed God and God uh, credited it to him as righteousness or justified him by his faith. And there's two kinds of religion. There's law and works where thou shalt and thou shalt not, and and you get favor by, by obeying, or there's faith and grace. The New Testament, the gospel, is not about law and works. It's about not, not about what we do for God and some ledger that he keeps score on. It's about what Jesus did and us having faith and God pouring out his, his grace. And then in chapter 5, he begins to talk about the fruit of justification, that when we by faith trust Jesus, we're declared righteous and holy and not guilty, and, and, and then we'll, we'll learn how to live out, live that out. But in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, very important verses to me personally, he says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Years ago, a friend of mine asked me to visit his dad who was dying of lung cancer. And he, his dad was not a, a believer. He wasn't an atheist. He was an agnostic. And an agnostic doesn't say there's not a God. You just can't know either way. And so I went over with my friend, and we talked, and talked about the Bible and did apologetics, and I didn't know what I was getting into. And uh, just kind of felt like, you know, I was, it was bouncing off the wall, everything that I was saying to him. And I kind of walked away from that conversation disappointed. Like, I wanted, you know, he's, this man's about to die. And uh, a couple days later, my friend called and he said, my dad wants to talk to you again. Would you be willing to go see him? And I said, sure. He said, I'm not going to be able to go with you, so it's just going to be you and him. So I, I showed up and sat at his kitchen table with him, and, and I didn't have anything prepared at all, nothing that I was ready to, to do. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit said, read Romans 5, 1 and 2, the verses that I just read. And I said, hey, can I read something to you? And he said, sure. And I said, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he stopped me. He goes, Scott, hold on. He said, um, I've always believed that there, there was some sort of God or creator. He said, but I didn't know what to do with the Jesus fellow. <laughs> and uh, he said, according to what you read to me, I come to God through Jesus Christ. I said, that's it, man. And I said, do you want to come to God through Jesus Christ and have peace with God? He said, I do. And uh, he lit up a cigarette, <laughs> and we prayed together, and um, he prayed and, and made peace with God through Jesus Christ. I mean, I still get, you know, the goosebumps when I think of that story and just the power of the gospel. That I, when I read that to him, it was the power of the gospel. That's why the theme of Romans is the power of the truth of the gospel. In Romans 5, 17, he writes, for if by the offense of the one, meaning Adam's sin, death reigned through the one, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one, Jesus Christ. This key phrase there, we reign in life. How do we reign in life? I wonder if you feel like you're reigning in life. Because what happens is, when we are declared righteous and holy and not guilty by God, the fact is, is while you're alive, you still sin. We still blow it. And whenever you preach grace, people get offended because they think if you preach too much grace, then people are going to live however they want to and think, ah, I'm, I'm under grace. I, I can live how I want. God doesn't care. Well, that's the farthest thing from the truth. The Apostle Paul anticipated that same question coming from his audience when you get to chapter 6. Does grace lead to sin? And Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? 
may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? And if you're like me, you know that you're still aware that you're a sinner, that you still blow it, even though we're in Christ and we've been forgiven. How do we live out the position of righteousness, the positional righteousness? How do we live that out? It's a process. It's, it is a process, and Paul anticipated that. And so continuing in chapter 6, to walk and reign in life, there's something we need to know. There's, there's a truth. There's something in our minds that we need to, to know. And in uh, verse 6, he says, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. There's something we need to know. He says, you need to know you were crucified with Christ. Well, how did that happen? That was 2,000 years ago. I'm here, you know, in, in, in modern times, right? Well, I always ask the question, so how do we know that we were crucified with Christ? Because you got to remember, God's life is outside of time and space. So he considers us crucified with Jesus. When he died on the cross, we died with him. When we were, and we were raised with him, as we'll find out. But how many people were crucified next to Jesus when he was on the cross? Two, right? Two criminals, one on his right, one on his left. How do we know that? Well, the Bible says so. The Scriptures teaches that. How do I know I was crucified with Jesus? It says so. That's what we apprehend in, in our head as a truth. There's also something we need to, to consider or something we need to, to count on. And that's found in chapter 6, verse 11. He says, Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That considering or counting on is an act of faith on our part. It's something that happens in our heart. And then he says that there's something we need to offer. Our participation in our growth and sanctification is there is effort on our part, but it doesn't merit anything. It's just we're called to participate. It's an act of our will. In verse 13 of chapter 6, he says, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of righteousness, but offer yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. That's how we walk it out. We, we got to know what's true, count on it, consider it, and then give him our wills. Then he moves into chapter 7. Chapter 7 is an amazing chapter. It's all about the purpose of the law. What was the purpose of the Ten Commandments? What, was the, what is the, the purpose of the moral law in, in the Old Testament? Well, in a sense, Paul's argument is that that the law, and he's a guy who knew the law, right? He was a Pharisee. The purpose of the law is, is it's, it's a fault finder. It's finding fault. It's a mirror. Just as you hold up a mirror to see the dirt on your face, you, um, you look at the law and you realize how short I fall of, of, of who God is and his standards and his glory. Just like if you're driving sometimes in, in your car and you see one of those speed limit signs that, that's telling you what the speed limit is and then how fast you're actually going and it begins to, to blink to you. It's finding fault in your driving. That's what the law does. And years ago, I was, um, I was on a mission trip as a youth pastor and on our way home, we had to go through Paris poor us, right? And we went to the top of the, the Eiffel Tower, and we got all the way to the top, and I could see the beautiful view of, of Paris. And all of a sudden, I looked down, and there was a sign that said, do not spit in English. And I hadn't even been thinking about spitting until all of a sudden, I was told I couldn't do it. So I honestly like looked around and spit off the Eiffel Tower and watched it float all the way to the bottom. I wouldn't even have done that had, had it not told me not to do it. That's the law. The law in chapter 7, he says, arouses the sinful nature. The harder you and I try to live by rules and do's and don'ts, the more we'll find ourselves attracted 
to those do's and don'ts. Paul says, the things that I, I want to do, I don't do. The things that I know I shouldn't do, I find myself doing. Who will save me? Who will rescue me? He says, thanks be to God. Through Jesus, we're rescued. Chapter 8 is all about life in the Holy Spirit and this new life that we have, this justification by faith and how we live by the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful chapter. And then Paul, I, I think you summarize chapters 1 through 8 with the word faith. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So I think faith, and he talks at the end of chapter 8 that we're more than conquerors because of Christ. That if God is for us, who can be against us? It's such a beautiful passage. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. In chapters 9 and 11, he, he switches it to hope. Because Paul is, is agonizing over his fellow Jewish brethren that have rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And he's, he goes through all these scriptures in the Old Testament about their rejection will lead to uh, the acceptance of the rest of the world, the Gentiles, and, and what's going to happen you know, to the Jewish people. It's a real message of, and the scriptures are full of this tension between divine sovereignty, meaning God's in control, to human responsibility. And how does that tension flow? Nine, chapters 9, 10, and 11 are beautiful about how God is at work on behalf of all people and how humans still have a responsibility to participate in trust. And then chapters 12 through 15 is all about practical righteousness. We move, he moves from this you know, position of who we are in Christ by faith to here's how you should live then. Here's what a person who is in Christ lives like. And he talks about love and respecting authority and not being a stumbling block to believers in your Christian liberty. Christian liberty is the wisdom and ability to, to take a gray area or an area where the Scripture might be silent on or, or gray or, or not you know, perfectly understood and it's knowing that if I have the freedom to do something that somebody else's conscience doesn't, that I don't shove that in their face, that I respect them, and that maybe it's something that I, 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 I do in private versus touting it to everybody or expecting everybody else to do it. Because what was going on is you had people who were eating meat sacrificed to idols in these, these towns where temples worship would happen. You'd have someone, you know, they would offer the meat to the idol, Obviously, nothing happened to the meat. Then they would go sell the meat in the market and go home and cook it and eat it. That caused the Jewish Christians to stumble because that, that went against all the Levitical law and, 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 and idolatry and all the things that, that came with that. So Paul gives a great message on that. And then he ends in chapter 16 with all his personal relationships with the folks in Rome greet this person and that person and thank God for this person. He gives a great benediction at the very end that I want to just read to you a, a, a way to a doxology, so to speak. He says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifest, manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be glory forever. Amen. May you receive that blessing as you study the book of Romans.